see that through ball. You've got the vision for it. You've had the, done the head check. You've done the scan, but don't have the technical skill to hit that ball with the outside of the foot to give it the right spin because that's what that pass, that's what that option requires for success. Well, then we need to look at tactically how can you achieve that? Do you need to take it across your body and use the inside of your foot? Uh, or do you look for a different pass because you don't have the, the technical skill to do it? And it's it's quite an intertwined web that needs to come together. And, and it's messy. It actually looks quite messy. Good talent um, development or player development looks quite messy because it has to be. Because when the game's on, it is messy. It's not all structured and, and uh, rigid where A goes to B, B to C, C to D. Um, and, and I guess giving the kids the tools for that and combining their software with their hardware is very important for the modern player. Um, and then the tie-in with that is this is how we actually do it with our kids uh, in our soccer program. We're in, we give them a, a physical talent profile sheet and, and we ask them to rate themselves out of 10 for those categories, but based only on their age group. And this is sometimes a little bit hard as well for, for kids to grasp. Is I don't want to compare you to Ronaldo because Ronaldo is a, a top-end player at the back end of his career. I'd rather you compare yourself to that other under-15s NPL girl or boy that plays with you or that community player. And where do you rank in your team? Where do you rank in your league for the for these skills? Um, and I found that once we once we were able to communicate that well with our kids, they came up with really really good and manageable talent profiles where they could actually set small targets to move their rating up. And I, we found that it was a really effective tool because now they can go back and they can look at it in six months' time and see how much they've moved uh, in that in those six categories. So um, yeah, something that I think coaches should invest a little bit more time in because there is so much dead time where a player could be, instead of watching Netflix, they might be actually doing one of these profiles at home and they submit it to you as a coach at your club uh, a week or so later. And then you just keep it on file. And when you have a chance as a coach and everyone's busy with their lives, but there is always downtime and you pick a moment where you can flick through them and then you get an idea of your player. Now, once you understand your player, you can then greater understand how to influence them. Um, and then on that, we, we actually continued the, the interviewing of our children, especially now during lockdown. So we took lockdown as a huge advantage um, rather than a negative where we could work on the mental aspect of the play and the things that you probably neglect uh, when you can train on the field. So we asked them the question, what's the most important part of developing as a soccer player? And the, it's funny because most of them put first mental. So mental won the, won the race by a fair margin from technical mm -hmm. And then slightly less was tactical and physical. And this was from about 40 kids that we surveyed. It's interesting, though, because before COVID-19 restrictions, we asked them, how much time did you actually spend on developing your mental skills? And only a handful of kids said they spent a lot of time. A, a fair selection said some of the time. And some said very little. So it's interesting that they've actually decided that they think the mental aspect is the most important, yet it's the one that we perhaps least focus on. And I think I've made it, um, made, made it my goal in life to, to use that as the driving force for my training because I believe most coaches can, can search something on YouTube or pick up a, a, an instructional manu, manual yeah. with great sessions or go and observe a session and coach exactly how they see it. Like Guardiola has great sessions and Klopp has great sessions and Bielsa has great sessions and they're all suited to their team. And we can take that out of context and watch it and say, well, Guardiola does this, so I'm going to do this with my under-12s. Is it the right context? Is it the right time in their development to do those kind of drills? I don't know. That's, that's up to you as a coach. And I guess going back to reverse engineering, what you see. So um, we decided that there was five points for perfection, um, the modern player, to coach the modern player well. So the first one was we need to work on their growth mindset. We need to make them believe that they can get better with practice. Because if they don't believe that, then nothing else can stand up. We, we just can't continue to develop a player if they don't believe they can get better with practice. Um, they do need little milestones, I, I believe, to, to keep that level of motivation up. Arsene Wenger has a brilliant, I think it's a TED talk, where he speaks about stamina of motivation as opposed to high-intensity short-term motivation. And that's effectively what a growth mindset is. I'm going to fall, I'm going to fail, I'm going to make mistakes. But in those mistakes, I'm actually going to learn and get better. And that's, that's how your brain develops as well, you know, in, in terms of functioning of neurons. Goal setting. So within growth mindset, there's got to be little goals and targets. So it's, it's all well and good. I want to play for Australia. I want to play for Manchester United. Fantastic. That's probably your dream. What's your goal to get you to the next step that gets you a little bit closer to that dream? And what are those steps to success? 
And, and again, doing things like the talent profile, we have a, a reflection um, presentation that we do as well with our players to make sure that they can actually be honest about themselves and critically break their game down. These are the things I'm good at. These are things I'm okay at. These are things I really need to work on, which in my, in my training session in the week, which time am, or how much time am I allocating to each one to improve them? And that comes with those goal setting steps. On the bottom left is the deliberate practice. And this comes with not only the coach, but also the player in the sense of every session that I do has to have a purpose. So if I'm going to go outside and kick the ball against the wall, why am I doing it? Is it because I want to want to work on the outside of my foot? Is it because I want to work on how I receive the ball with my instep? Is it because I want to go outside and just build up a sweat and, and work on high, quick, rapid fire passes? As long as you've got the focus, then you can then measure the success of the session. Um, if you're just doing it haphazardly and just going out there, I think you, you waste, you're, you're going to learn something because there's, there's nothing doing a session is better than doing no session at all. But if you want to maximize your session, like you maximize your learning, go to a lecture and listen to someone speak and just mm -hmm. sit there and listen. Most of it will go through your head or go over your head. Sorry. Um, but if you take notes and you ask questions and then you go back and revisit those notes and you maybe contact that lecturer and get some more information on areas that you're not sure about, then all of a sudden you learn. And once you learn that, you can then go and tick that off your box and go and learn something else. So that's part of deliberate practice. Uh, the, la the, the last two is the environment. And the environment is the one that we as coaches have the most control over. So my teammates and my coaches help me grow is a really important thing that we try and emphasize to, it, to all young players. And that means that everyone in your squad or your training group is not necessarily playing to become a professional. In fact, probably most of them are not. They're playing for fun. They're playing because it's exercise. They're playing for whatever intrinsic and extrinsic reasons they have. But they don't all want to be pros. But for the, for the handful of kids that do want to be pros, they need those players in their team to be motivated to train well so that you have a, a substantial level of, of uh, pressure and challenge in your training session. So the key for the coach is how do I get um, Nick, who's not really that keen on playing soccer at a professional level, how do I get Nick mm. to train like he is so it helps Anthony, who really does want to try and get to Melbourne Victory or Melbourne City? And that's a really good challenge, but you can't, you can't obviously say that directly to the child because you don't know. So a kid that's talented at 12 doesn't necessarily end up being talented at 16 for whatever reason. You know, they can lose interest. They can, be, um, they can change to another sport. They can have an injury. They can have a bad experience with coaches or with, with teammates where it turns them off the game or they decide to focus on their education. We can't predict that. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes coaches, we get frustrated by that, but I think... And I'll definitely have something I've learned over time through my own reflection and experience. If I can still provide the best possible session for everyone that's there as close as I can, and then give that kid that needs the challenge, the challenge to an individual task when they go and get a drink or speak to them before the session and say, I'd really like you to work on this. Nobody else has to know about it. Then all of a sudden their environment is as good as that kid that's just playing for a bit of fun. And then the tie in all of this is the feedback and the feedback is, is the thing that binds it all together. So how are you assessing the progress of your players? What are you using to measure it? And how are they able to then assess their progress? And it's, it's such a powerful conversation for a player to have with a parent or with a coach where they can, um, they can reflect upon where they are, where they want to go and what they actually want from the game. I think um, you have that, if you've ever had that conversation as a coach, you, you find out, so much more about a play and, and it, it sort of fixes up that ignorance we have in our heads where we sometimes think we know more than we do. Um, and I'll give an example of it through a motiva motivational interviewing conversation I had with a, with a student on uh, Friday and it was about the way the student um, focuses on, on the game and, and what they want to get out of the game. So for, for that conversation to happen though, we need to develop that trust and there's a really good uh, image of, of trust being a three-legged stool. So the legs consist of the athletes, the coaches, and the parents, the three legs on the stool. Holding it together or the seat on top of the, on, on the chair is actually the trust. So if you remove a leg, if I take away the parent's involvement and they're not supportive, then it's going to collapse. If the coach doesn't care and doesn't show interest, then it's going to collapse. If I take away the trust, which holds all three together, then I can really create some serious problems for the athlete moving forward. Um, and that's what you want to try and avoid. So great coaches are trusted by the athletes. Um, and when the athletes know 
that their coach has their back and is, is doing the best thing for the child as opposed to the player, which again is a very different thing. So the person has to come before the player. Um, you're going to get much, much more successful outcomes. And, and I'm only speaking from my own experiences with kids um, in terms of keeping their trust and making sure that we continue to grow their trust in us so that they don't fear asking a question or they don't fear saying, I need to sit, sit this one out because I'm really, really sore and I don't want to make it worse. Um, and if you don't trust your coach, if you think your coach is going to blow up and say, oh, you're always injured or, or put you down in some way, then you're probably going to hide that and, and you're potentially going to develop a serious injury that you could have avoided. So trust is, is hugely important, more so to this, this current generation of player, maybe than in ones in the past. Um, so I guess to finish, finish off what I think is important for players, this is something I've been learning about more recently um, through some, some webinars and then I picked up a few of the books that go with it on motivational interviewing. It's pioneered by a South African psychologist, Stephen Rolnick. And um, he looks at, you know, three levels of, of, um, of a player. So there's the surrender, there's the supporting autonomy, and there's the control. So when you're a coach, um, you can either be the surrenderer or as a parent as well, do whatever you want to do. Whatever happens, happens. It's your choice. We then have the far opposite side of that spectrum, which is the complete control, where you're holding the player like a puppet. You do what I tell you to do. But we want to work towards that midpoint, and this is where the, the brilliance of motivational interviewing, which is effectively just having really good, deep conversation with an athlete or with a person, comes into. And it's used not only in sport, it's used in education, it's used in business, and it's had some phenomenal results. Um, and this supporting autonomy is where you, where you work with the athlete and the player and you say, okay, let's figure out what to do together. And this only comes with information. So... Um, I thought I'd, I'd read a little bit of a, a transcript without using the name of the player um, from the other day. Now, I will tell you, motivational interviewing takes time because this conversation started at 8.40 p.m. and I think it finished at uh, 10.35 p.m. So it was back and forth using a, a chat thing that we use at school. Um, and the question was, how do you start the question to, to, mo to get a, a child to, first of all, accept that this is going to be a conversation about them? So... The first question I asked is, are you in the mood for some conversation about soccer? The response was always. I then said, okay, cool. Can you come up with three reasons why you love playing central midfield? So obviously this player is a, a midfielder. And the player came up with, uh, it, was com it was a comfortable position for me. I feel like I'm used to it there um, more than anywhere else. And I just really used that. I really got used to that position because I've been playing, it since, playing in that position since I started soccer. So... For me, you can be judgmental about this statement and say, okay, what's happened with her youth soccer that's made her only play one position? Um, all of her answers to me seem to be related to being comfortable. So I asked the next question. I said, okay, so if I'm understanding what you're saying, is it mainly because you are used, or com used, to, used to or being comfortable at that position? Does that sound right? She then replied, yes. I then asked her, okay, do you generally feel afraid or excited by changes in life, not just in soccer? And then her next, uh, the next part of the conversation said, I feel a bit of both. So, so we would go, okay. My next part was, and you notice I start a lot with okay, because I'm trying to reassure that this is a conversation that is about developing the person, not so much about the player first and foremost. So then it goes to, can you share why you think a bit of both? And then the player says, okay, I feel excited because it'd be something new to, and good to learn and, I might, and it might be something I really like. But on the other side of it, I feel afraid because it could end badly or be a terrible experience and I may not like or enjoy it. So I won't read the whole thing. I'll read one, one more section. I'll skip to the end of the conversation. So when, uh, the next part for that was when you say badly or a terrible experience, do those thoughts feel like they became hard to forget over time or especially if you make a mistake early in the game or in a training session. And then the reply from the player was, oh, my God, yes. If I make a mistake early, it stays in my mind for the rest of the game. So at this point, and, and this has happened in the space of 20 minutes, so it's 9 o'clock by the time that response has come, I've then asked this question, which, which basically opened up the full conversation with the player. Has that been something that has bothered you for a long time or is it something more recent like the last few years? Now, this player replied more recent. Now, for me, understanding how the adolescent brain works through a lot of the research that I've done, mm -hmm. I know that this player in, in the current 
environment is going through the the final stages of puberty. So therefore, decision making, empathy, um, irrational behaviour, mood swings, all of those things are actually happening, not because they're a moody teenager, but because physiologically their brain is changing. So now I'm already st- starting to understand something different because the reason I started the conversation with this player was last two training sessions, the player looked really flat and wasn't, didn't seem that interested and it wasn't the usual player that I've seen. Now, this is obviously an extraordinary time with, with COVID and that and at school, the kids have been able to train in, in their PE lessons as normal. So um, we, we kind of just assume that, oh, they'll be dying to train and play because they can't do anything else. Um, but but it goes to show that there was something else in in the player that we just couldn't. If if I just observed from the side and I'd say disinterested player, you know something's wrong or uh, this player's done with with their development. There's no more future. So the conversation is very important to actually first of all clear my head because we all make assumptions. We make assumptions as humans because we can't help ourselves, mm-hmm. um, and sometimes we overthink a situation. But sometimes it's just enough of a trigger to start that conversation. Now. I could have had the conversation one-on-one with the student face-to-face, but I've, I've realised that the modern player, the modern teenager, kind of is more comfortable in most cases speaking like this where they can, you know, take their time with their response, type it to you. Um, you know, we don't care about spelling mistakes in these conversations. That's not the point. The point is that that's how they communicate with each other. So maybe that's how we need to communicate a little bit more with them as coaches um, for this kind of stuff. Because if I'm just giving this player an instruction on the field, well, we can do that in 30 seconds um, on the sidelines while we're in the game or, or while they're having a drink break. But to get a bit deeper and understand what's the problem, um, you know, the, the player starts talking about, I'm starting to take the game more seriously than I was when I was younger. So now every time I make a little mistake, it really upsets me more because I, th- I feel like I'm giving myself setbacks in where I want to go with my career. So all of a sudden you're starting to see links with the player that otherwise you wouldn't have seen. Um, so if I, I'll scroll, scroll down to the conversation and I'll finish the last bit of it and it'll show you how much there's a lot of depth to the conversation and, and my questioning and the way motivational interviewing works is I either affirm a statement that the, the player's already made to me or I just continue to ask them questions that lead them to come up with the solution and that's the power of motivational interviewing. I think that's the power of coaching and teaching in a nutshell. How can you get your player to make the decision themselves and what you need to do is you need to guide them and it's not a manipulation thing it's you need to work with them so if at any point this player shut down and didn't want to speak to me any further about this then that's the end of that conversation and i might try again later but they were willing to continue with and i kept you know during the thing i said if you want to stop now if it's getting late we can stop i was watching an afl game um in between this and that that kind of gave me a bit of a break from it and let me think about things differently um and um and it gave the player an opportunity then to go as deep in terms of how much they want to share with me or as shallow as they want to. And that's so important. If I did this, if I did this in front of a group of players and asked this player these kind of questions, do you know what my responses would be? Have a guess. It'd be very different. Imagine. It wouldn't be much. Because you know yourself, when you ask kids, do you understand that drill? How many kids actually say no? Exactly. Yeah, and then they go and set up the drill and it falls to pieces and you're like, wow, that, that was awesome. Everyone <laughs> said they understood it. Um, and that's, and that's, that's the reality of it. And, and that comes with also the biology of a player. Um, you know, boys, boys are a little bit more okay with that as part of their, their, their DNA and their brain yeah. and that you can criticise them in front of the group. Girls don't like that. Girls would rather you speak to them individually. Um, and that's, that's fine. You just need to learn that. As a coach, you need to understand you're coaching those players so if you're coaching under 14 girls what do under 14 girls think like what do they what are the, what's important to them as an under 14 girl it's not what's important to you because what's important to you you can get across subliminally to them if you plan your sessions well so if you think you know chasing and harassing when they lose possessions important for them to develop you don't need to tell them that you just need to design your session so that it educates them to do that how do you reinforce it? Well, you need to work out how those that group of players, so how 13 and 14-year-old girls respond to feedback and how do I give them the best feedback so that I know what to do. And it won't be the same for an elite group of NTC girls, for example, um, yeah. or TIDC, sorry, these days, um, or, or for a senior team. So every team and every player will have individual responses to you as a person. And you'll need to – this takes time. So this conversation that I had with this player – 
again, took two and a half hours, but it was so, so, it's so valuable to me. There, there's, I've got so much to work on with this player now, and I've, I've done all the groundwork. Now, yeah. I did a similar conversation with another player last night um, as well. I, so I, the way I work is I message them and say, whenever you're free to chat about your game or you just, just got a bit of time, just let me know. And then when, they, when they're ready, they decide when that conversation is going to start. Um, and, that, and the conversation with this player was completely different to the one I had, the one that I just explained to you, it was so much more eye-opening to me as to why this particular player has maybe lost their focus on being an elite footballer has a different pathway that um, they want to take up within football. And I didn't know that. And, I, and all I could see in training was, um, you know, perhaps not taking it as seriously as I thought they would. So, it, again, this is the importance of speaking to your players and getting to know your players as much as possible and also letting them come up with this, the, the guiding and the solution and you kind of just bring them to the conclusion, I think. So, yeah. Um, to, to finish off her conversation... Um, it was, uh, where is it? Here we go. Uh, it is hard to remember. Oh, here we go. I'll start again. So the question went like this, it ended up like this, um, back in your world, is it fair to say that you really only have control over yourself and how you present yourself on the pitch? Even when some of your teammates play more for social fun, because this is where the direction the conversation went. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the player responded, yes, I do believe it's all under my own control and how I play is up to me, not so much how my teammates are playing, even if they're not doing their best. I said, is it hard to... Rem- is, uh, okay, is that hard for you to remember sometimes when you're playing with players that are playing just more socially because this player's reaching that age where, yeah. um, again, they want to take it a bit more seriously, but a lot of their friends at their club are not. And then the response was, sometimes I'll notice myself trying to adapt to how my teammates are playing um, if they're doing bad, which is something I need to change, um, which means she's being influenced by the, the players. Um, and then we went to, I think, I think we all do from time to time, and this is the affirmation statement, so I think we all do from time to time, and I think it is normal. Um, what we can always try to do is to quickly snap out of it or give ourselves a trigger so I've given her some advice on how to potentially deal with it when it happens, but it's all been advice tailored to her problem. And I think the crux of it is as a coach and as a teacher and as a parent, if you're just handing out advice for the sake of handing out advice, one, your advice becomes irrelevant um, and it, it's, not, it's not at the right time. It's not going to have the right impact. So let the player decide when... When the moment, and you have to decide as a coach in that conversation, when is the moment that I give my opinion? Do they even need my opinion? Because the, the conversation I had last night, the player didn't need my opinion. The yep. conclusion would come to completely by them. I was just the person prodding them to come up with the reasoning. And that, that's the beauty, I think, of coaching the modern player is that you need to understand the person first. You really need to give that person the time. And once you've done that, you're going to get a lot more enjoyment out of your coaching and they're going to get a hell of a lot more enjoyment out of you as a coach as well so um that that's my suggestion to to the modern coach and i will suggest i've got a, a i know there's a bibliography that you can share with with the um the listeners and the books that i've mentioned in there and i think only one of them has anything to do with football yeah and that's i think that's the beauty of it as well is we get sometimes so bogged down with understanding more about the game uh, in the sense of the technical tactical side of the game but there's a whole other world out there that we can really explore about the brain, especially how the adolescent brain works completely differently to the adult brain. And again, completely differently to a child's brain. Yes. And if you understand the brain. If you understand what the brain is driving in that person, then all of a sudden you can plan around that and you cannot take certain things to heart and you can plan. So there's some great books there. I'd strongly suggest as a starting point, Sarah Jane Blakemore and Uta Firth, um, which is called The Learning Brain lessons for education and it, it's just it's just eye-opening to what's going physiologically what's going uh, on inside the, the head of a teenager as opposed to what we think's going on as an adult um, and I, I know Sarah Jane Blakemore has some brilliant TED talks on that as well um, but again the TED talk it's probably the, the thing with the young athletes we seem to think we can get the solution in a one-hour TED talk I strongly suggest it's a good starting point but um, go and read the book. And, and any of the books that, that are on that list there will give you a completely different perspective on how to coach. got nothing to do with soccer. Even the one that's about Barcelona in that list is not about Barcelona 
um, the team. It's about the organisation and, and the DNA of the organisation and how that had to change in order for the club to achieve the success on the field. So, um, yeah, so for everybody, that's that's out the take of a, of a teacher slash coach on the modern player. And I think um, if we can get that right, we're going to start to see less dropout in the game. We're going to see a lot more engagement from the kids. And, and I pray for this last one is we're going to see some really quality young coaches coming through. They decide that the playing side of it's not their pathway, but they believe that they can educate the next generation. And if we can do that, then we've done a fantastic job for, for our future all in Australia. Perfect. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for your presentation. It was, it was a brilliant one. It was a long one, but it was, I think it was a great presentation to have for our viewers and to kick this new series off. Thank you, Rohit. Always a pleasure working with you. Have a nice okay. day. Oh, till next time, mate. That's right.